So I'm very happy and pleased to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Jennifer Ballard. And I uh, personally like Jennifer a lot. <laughs> she comes to the first Friday lunches, which were my idea for this year, and I hope some more of you get, people will come. Um, it's at the Thai food place, starting at 11.30 on the first Friday of the month. Anyway, Jennifer has her LMFT. She graduated from Dominican University, and she has a bachelor's degree in uh, human development. And she's done lots of work with nonprofits and also worked four years in the schools. So she has a lot of experience with family and kids, and she does play therapy regularly. And she does SAM play. And I, um, we consult, we consulted on that, and I enjoy her a lot. Yeah. And I know she's going to have a really good uh, presentation mm -hmm. for us today. So let's welcome Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. What a warm introduction. Just what I needed. So let me ask you, get a quick show of hands, how many of you guys have or do currently work with uh, any kids with ADHD or know any kids with ADHD? Okay. Younger than 18, 25, okay, thank you. So you likely know that these kids have trouble with things like thoroughly finishing their schoolwork and getting it in on time, right? Managing their behavior at home and at school, and getting out the door on time with everything that they need, right? Well, if this kid comes to my office and I start talking to him, I might say something like, tell me about school, or hey, I've got a great checklist I can make for you, right? I'm gonna get what I refer to as the slide. And you'll see the kid on the couch there, and there'll be a soft gaze that comes over their eyes. <laughs> and then the neck might twilt, uh, tilt to a side, the shoulders sag, and then the whole body kind of follows this downward motion, right? Right off the couch, okay? Our challenge is to engage these kids, not only with a way that helps them become involved in what they're seeing, right, in their own world, but also in a way that teaches them, okay? Play therapy has the benefits of both being therapeutic and enjoyable for kids. Playfulness allows kids to relax and also be open, right, receptive, okay? So what we're gonna talk about today is those things, all right? The presentation of a deficit in executive functioning which is ADHD, but you'll see after this presentation as we go through that it really runs across other diagnoses as well. And we're gonna talk about the role of play therapy in that. Okay, so how we're gonna do that is this. I'm gonna define executive functioning for you. We're gonna look at common presenting problems related to EF. We're gonna look at ways to assess EF deficits. And then lastly, my favorite part, we're gonna do some play interventions for EF. So that'll be at the end, that's a reward today. It's my reward today. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. So executive functions. There's actually no standardized definition, all right? But across all, what we see is that it is essential to self-regulation. Okay, acquiring the early building blocks of these skills is one of the most important tasks of early childhood. And the opportunity to build further on these capacities is essential to healthy development in middle childhood, adolescence, and early adult life. Executive function emerges early in infancy and it continues to develop well into adolescence. The development parallels the development of the prefrontal cortex. Let me know if I go in and out here, I'll move this. So the prefrontal cortex, we know this is the part of the brain that contributes to executive function by allowing us to reflect on a situation and consider a range of options as opposed to acting impulsively or out of habit. Okay, it is the executive versus the automatic. All right, why is this important? A lot of reasons. 
So kindergarten teachers rank self-regulation as one of the most important competencies for school readiness. Some scientists who study executive function will refer to the executive functions as the building blocks, right? the biological foundation of school readiness. They argue that strong working memory, executive, excuse me, I'm going to say executive a lot today. Okay, cognitive self-control and attentional skills provide the basis upon which children's abilities to learn develop. Okay, so it's the focusing, the planning, and the remembering. Essentially, this is how kids learn, right? So it's the how of the what. So when they get the how, they can then master the content. Now, self-regulation also gives us, gives us the ability to delay gratification. You guys are familiar with the marshmallow experiment, right? Years ago, still provides us with tons of information, okay? Where the researchers went in and they said, you can have one marshmallow now to preschoolers, or if you wait, you can have two marshmallows. The wait was approximately 15, 20 minutes. Now these kids, what they were measuring was self-regulation, right? So some of them ate the marshmallow right, right before they even got out of the room. The researchers got out of the room, right? And some of them were able to, to hold that delay, right? To get the gratification, which was the two marshmallows. And how they did that was use their executive functions, okay? And we're going to look at those in more detail. But we know as adults that delayed gratification, that's the bigger rewards, right? That's my retirement fund that I haven't started yet. <laughs> but it's going to be a reward, hopefully. Um, that's, that's the diploma, right? That's graduating high school. And going even younger, that's the movie at the end of the week if all the kids can turn in their homework, right? These kids with executive functioning deficits have a hard time holding that delayed gratification in mind. Okay. So let's look at these neurologically based skills in a lot more detail. So there's over 33 executive functions, some people say. I took the key executive functions today. And they're a set of overlapping skills, okay? These are essentially the stop and think skills. So what Russell Barkley did, who's a leading authority on ADHD, was he took these skills and he put them to a pattern, okay? He said they go from external to internal, okay? Really important concept when we get to treatment. So behavior to the world turns inward as a form of self-control. So let's look at these. Self-monitoring, right? Attention to the world turns inward and it becomes self-awareness. So a kid might look around his class and see that everybody else is on task, right? They're working on the worksheet, but he's not. So he notices that and he gets to his worksheet. Kids with executive functioning deficits don't really realize that, right? Or they have inconsistencies realizing that, okay? This is the first to develop, and it takes about a, a decade to come, become fully mature in a child. Self-restraint or response inhibition, right? This allows the child, after they've monitored, right, to then look at themselves and adjust their reactions, right, to do that pause. So behavioral inhibition is the stop of the stop and think. Kids start to do this physically, right? You'll see little kids, um, they'll be saying something and the teacher says, okay, quiet down, right? They'll go like that, right? Because it's external, it's external to internal, okay? Or my favorite is if you're on a school campus and you watch the first graders line up, right? And the teacher's like, everybody in a straight line, and they're like this, right? But they're trying, right? They're kind of moving around like this, right? because it's external, right? They're trying to get a hold of their body, okay? And what that does is that becomes internal as, as behavioral inhibition. Okay, um, let's see, let's go to working memory. Working memory is very important. We see to ourselves. Most people have a working memory that is visual imagery. 
So if I'm at the mall and I want to get back to my car, I'm going to recall where I parked, right, by the things that I saw. That's my working memory. Now, we're going to replay these images of our past to guide us to a future goal. So think of kids who are trying to hold a math formula in their mind, right? Math gets really difficult for these kids. It's difficult for a lot of kids, but it's especially difficult for these kids because they have to hold different parts of the formula in their mind and remember which ones to pull out when, okay? Working memory. Internalized speech. Toddlers narrate their world, right? Anybody got some toddlers in their life, right? It doesn't matter if you're in the room or not, they're talking, <laughs> and it's lovely, it's joyous. We're following that model, right? External to in internal, right? We see that from five to seven, they start to turn that into a form of self-control, okay? It's still external. They might say something like, oh, I'm gonna put this here. No, I think it goes over here, right? So it's moving to that form of self-control, that self-regulation. Now, from about probably age seven and on, right, they don't need to, well, I like guess a little earlier, not everybody follows this you know, specific developmental path, but it, they don't have to say it out loud anymore, right? It's internal, and it's that voice in your head. Who uses the voice in your head, right? We all do, right? It's, um, I need to remember this and this and this today, right? I don't have to say it out loud because it's the voice in my head. Really important. And kids with executive function are lacking a strong voice in their head, okay? The voice in their head is also going to deliver these first three. Right? So if they look around them and they notice that their behaviors are not in line, with what they need to be, they're going to tell themselves, oh, you know, right? Um, you know, sit down, Jennifer, right? You need to be quiet. They're going to kind of guide themselves. But if they're lacking that internal voice, they're going to have a lot of difficulty with that. Okay, emotional control. When do kids need to control their emotions? All the time, right? They're learning. Now, what we know, though, is that this becomes really important in social relationships, right? Because they may need to be strategic. And if they want that toy, right, they, they maybe they can't grab it because they also want to play with that kid later at recess, right? So they're going to need to control their emotions, right? They're going to need that pause. Okay. So where are we at? Emotional control. Goal orientation. Let me say, these first five here, they lead to goal orientation and cognitive flexibility, right? This is planning and problem solving. So I've got a goal in mind, and this is how I'm going to get there. That's what these allow us to do. The ability to switch focus. That becomes really important, right? That's cognitive flexibility. It becomes really important if you're playing video games and you need to do your homework. And if we have time, we can talk about how this relates to video games. Really important, uh, interesting. It's an interesting, because um, video games actually supply a lot of these executive functions. So that cognitive flexibilities allows us to, once we have a goal and something doesn't go right, right, we get to, we get to change our plan, right? We get to switch it up. So play provides the training ground for executive function. And let's look at an example. So let's say there's a group of kids and they're playing house. What do they do? Right? They've got to assign roles. You're the mean mom. Right? You're the dad who works all the time. You're going to be the dog who runs away. Right? And then what they do is they have to remember all of those roles while they're playing out that story. They have to have the cognitive flexibility to, to go with it if something goes wrong. What if another kid wants to join the play, right? Or somebody wants to leave the play, right? So play really is the training ground for executive functioning. It, they're planning, they're problem solving, right? They're keeping up their social relationships. So play is extremely important for kids. And I'm not just saying that as a play therapist.
Okay, so what do deficits sound like when we get that call, right? That intake call. So I'm going to read some examples and I'm going to have you guys look at your handout here and, and throw out what you think it is. Okay. I'm so frustrated. My son has such a hard time getting out the door in time for school. We have been late three times this week. He, is, he, he forgets his things even when he gets there on time. The bedtime routine is so problematic that even my husband and I are arguing. All right, what do you guys think? Working memory? memory? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, you got that one, absolutely. Sense of time, really hard for these kids, All right? So parents who say, um, get, off the, you know, get off the TV in 10 minutes, All right, not gonna happen. Okay, let's hear another one. I have to constantly remind my 12-year-old about things. I don't want to be a nag. He should know these things already. Lower your voice in the library. Don't say certain things at the dinner table. The other day I heard him telling a story to a friend that never happened. I'm worried how he's going to turn out. What do you guys think? Mm-hmm. You got it. Good job. And these are overlapping skills, right? So there's a little bit, little bits here and there of each one. Okay, last one. My daughter has tantrums. It's so hard to calm her down once it starts. She has them over the smallest things. Like the other day, we were at her friend's house and we had to leave in the middle of their game. I was so embarrassed by her behavior. I feel as out of control as she does. I just don't get it. My younger daughter acts more mature than she does. You got it, yeah. Maybe a little parent education, <laughs> right? Leaving a game's not a small thing. Okay, do you guys get any calls like this at your office? Yeah, yeah. okay, good, good. All right, so I want to talk about the failure cycle because a lot of these kids end up in it, okay? And we get a lot of these kids in the failure cycle. So let's say there's an attempt. Right? An attempt is going to be another math worksheet. Right? It's going to be, oh, just get, you know, get, I, need you to, I need you to get to bed. Right? I'm, I'm so tired of reminding you to do everything. Right? So there's going to be an attempt. These kids don't have the skills that they need consistently right? to succeed consistently. And so there's going to be a failure. Well, we don't like failure, right? We get frustrated because these kids are trying. They're trying really hard, most likely. Now, once there's frustration, well, we're going to do our darndest to avoid that, right? Nobody likes those feelings. Now, when we start to avoid it, there's a lack of practice, right? What happens when these kids get a lack of practice is that there's no improvement, right? We know this. And then what happens? Loss of self-esteem loss of motivation, okay? The kids that we get in our offices, they probably come to us right in there, right? Because they will, they will avoid these failures. Avoidance looks like, oh, I have a stomach ache. I can't go to school today. Avoidance looks like kids who throw things across, across the classroom, right? Because they're going, they're going to be sent out, right? And so what they're doing is they're avoiding that failure. Okay, because it just doesn't feel good. All right. So we're going to look at some diagnoses that executive functioning shows up in. Let's see. Matthew yeah. Effect. Oh, Matthew effect. Sorry, Matthew effect is the disparity that happens when um, kids who who don't get that lack of practice, right? They don't improve, but they see all of their other peers improving. Okay, Matthew Effect refers to the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. It's a, um, a Bible story. The, um, the school that that was from actually is on the East Coast, and it's a school for children who have learning disabilities, and the children came up with that, and then they got some teacher input. So the children know, right? They know that they're not measuring up, right? Okay. 
So diagnoses, um, you, know, you can certainly get a diagnosis if you have a, a high enough deficit in executive functioning. You can also have a lot of problems and not meet criteria for a diagnosis. Okay, so we're looking at impairment level. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We know this one, right? That's kind of the obvious one. Specific learning disorder. A lot of times I was, when I was working in the school and I worked with all the kids with IEPs and 504 plans and what I noticed is when they had executive functioning deficits, they also had specific learning disorders such as auditory processing, right? Okay, some had visual spatial, right, um, difficulties, um, reading, reading disorder, right? Because they don't, they don't learn uh, like some of the other kids learn, okay? So difficulties with executive function are typical in childhood, right? It's developing in adolescence, right? Big time. But they're, but they're especially pronounced in children who are diagnosed with these disorders. So um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and I should say, you can have some of these diagnoses and not have executive functions, okay? It's not a conclusive list, it's not a definitive list, okay? So post-traumatic stress disorder, what we know about that is that the brain regions involved in the circuits associated with executive functioning have extensive interconnections, right, with deeper brain structures that control the developing child's response to threat and stress. This implies that the developing executive functioning system both influences and is affected by a young child's experience and management of threat and stress. Now, when you have a child who has anxiety, right, we know that there's a short circuit, right? There's a stimulus, there's a response, and the anxious brain will skip the frontal lobe and it'll go right to the amygdala, okay? So you're not getting that practice in the frontal lobe that you need. Now PTSD, when you have kids, right, who are under stress and threat a lot, right, they're anxious a lot, right, they're in that reactive mode and they're not going to get the practice that you need in that frontal lobe. Okay. So conduct disorder and ODD, these are um, a couple of my favorites. <clears throat> So we know that the frontal lobe and specifically um, the executive functions, they are responsible for our social development, are partly responsible, our emotional development, our cognitive development, but they're also, they also influence our moral development as well. And what these, def what these diagnoses have in common is that there is, there's, an, there's an influence right to the frontal lobe Okay, or there's, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word, but I'll get to it. So oppositional defiant disorder, what actually what you need, if it's true ODD, it'll, you can trace it back to preschool. Okay, so remember the failure cycle. These kids are throwing things, they might be yelling at their teachers, they're getting in arguments with their, with their parents. They meet criteria for ODD, right? But do they actually have it? Or are they in a system where they can't learn, right, as well as the other kids? So interesting diagnostic, diagnostic picture that we need to really tease apart when we get kids with learning disabilities. Okay. And by understanding EF, not only can we better target the interventions, okay, but here's the takeaway. We can help educate those that misunderstand these presentations, right? These kids are not lazy. They're not irresponsible. They didn't really mean to forget their homework, right? They're not necessarily intentionally defiant, and they're certainly not less intelligent, okay? Russell Barkley says ADHD is a disorder of performance rather than knowledge or skill, okay? These kids, they know the rules, right? They can often recite the rules, right? They just can't follow them, okay? Or they have trouble following them. Okay, because they are lacking self-regulation. Okay, any questions? Okay, we're gonna move, yeah. Do you particularly like Russell Barkley or ADHD? 
I do. I'm a, I'm a Russell Barkley fan. He's not the only one that influences, um, you know, kind of how I look at that diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. So assessment. Now, typical assessment, well, I should not say typical. A lot of assessment is, is a performance test. Right? They're done in a quiet room with one-on-one -on -one attention. Right? So they're informative. But what's really called for here is a dynamic assessment, particularly because we know that these executive functions are developing. Right? So they're going to be inconsistent. So we can get a, a really full picture if we take a dynamic assessment. And there's three components to that. A play observation. So it was back in the 1930s, developmental psychologist Lev Vygotsky, he was observing children and he noticed a really interesting thing. And that was that when children were playing, they were much more mature than when they were not playing, right? So play brought something out in them. Okay, so an example of that is a child who, he might grab somebody else's toy, right? He's kind of impulsive, he's lacking that response inhibition. If he's playing, let's say restaurant, right, something collaborative, some meal preparation, he's patient, right? He waits his turn, okay? Um, another, another example is a child who can't sit still maybe two, three minutes during circle time, right? If they're playing school, he can attend for five to 10 minutes, right? There's something that's extremely motivating in play for kids, and it calls upon their higher functioning. So play therapy is going to be, excuse me, <laughs> play observation is going to become really important. We also want to know, are these kids included in play, right? Or are they really lacking that emotional control um, to, to hold on to those relationships? Are they pushed out of play, right? It gives us an area of, a, or of, of treatment as well. Yeah. You're talking about organized play as opposed to just free play. I'm talking about, thank you, symbolic play, okay. pretend play. Right, so that, that play where they have to develop the scenario and they have to interact and collaborate, so less, less organized, yeah. Okay, Stuart Brown, um, the director, he's the director of the National Institute of Play. On the topic of neuroscience and play, he said play is the exploration of what is possible. Right, just beautiful to me. Play is the exploration of what is possible. So we're also going to want to get teacher feedback and observation over time, right? Because we know these kids are inconsistent. So how are they in a structured activity, right? That gives us a lot of good information. How do they do when they have lots of external cues helping them? Unstructured time, right? Lunch and recess. Some of these kids will have such a difficulty with sense of time that they don't even get out to the playground, right? They're, they're still eating their lunch, talking to their friends, and then recess is over, or lunch is over, right? And they don't get to go. Transitioning, transitions are hard for these kids, right? We know this, yeah, transitions are big time hard for these kids. So we wanna see, you know, how are they walking to class, changing activities, right? What is it that they do? Teacher and parent feedback, of course, right? Assisted performance, we're looking again, we're looking at what the child can do with external cues. Now remember how executive functions happen, right? They follow the pattern of external to internal, right? So when we put these external cues in front of them, what can they do? We want to see that. So the dynamic assessment becomes really important because it's also in multiple environments, right? And it's over time. I had a child who the, the mom called me and she said, you know, I had been seeing this, the son for a while and she said, he got out of the shower last night and I was in the kitchen cooking dinner, right? He comes over and he says, hey mom. She turns around, he's dripping wet and he's naked, right? He didn't know what to do next after he got out of the shower. He got out of the shower because the water turned cold, right? Sense of sense of time. He didn't do this every night, right? He remembered sometimes, but he just, he just didn't remember, okay? So that became a place of intervention for us. Dr. Susan Jaleo, who is, she's on one of your resource handout for parents, so that's positive parenting something.com. Um, she's fabulous with parents. She's very, 
she just speaks a parent's language. So the parents that I work with have really gotten a lot out of, of working with her um, through her website. She says, um, how do these kids get a routine in the morning, right? Routine and consistency and structure are gonna be very important. Have them get a routine that they can follow for the next 18 years, all right? Because that's what they need, right? They need that consistency. Because if something very, it, something kind of variates from that, right? They're, they don't have the cognitive flexibility, right? Or the goal orientation to say, oh yeah, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to do this and this happened, let me get back on track, right? Gone. So structure and consistency, really important for these kids. Okay. Yes, Michael. Do you think of, does the routine help them internalize the structure or does it just compensate for what they lack? It's a good question. And it's going to depend on if the executive functioning is delayed and it's still able to develop or if they're going to always need those external cues. Okay, so. What we're teaching ADHD kids is things that they're going to be able to use most likely the rest of their life, right? Does that answer your question? Repeat, yes. repeat it for me. Some, some people, their brain will develop and some it may not mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So the, the research is actually, a lot still needs to be done. So, so we can't train away some of these deficits, okay? But we can we can certainly we can certainly try and help them develop it, right? So what I've seen is some kids we have to write out that say that, that example, right? That morning routine. We'll have to write that out for them, we'll have to paste it on the, you know, wherever they're gonna see it. But after a while they may not need that. So they are internalizing it, right? It doesn't mean they can deviate from it, right? But they're internalizing it. Right? So we're practicing. We're giving them the, the tools to practice these things. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. It, it yeah. really helps with the morning routine to have pictures and write. Yes. Yes. They internalize it in different ways. Yeah, and you've got to make it age, age appropriate, right? Some pictures are going to be better for smaller ages, right? But it's two different ways to get the information. Yeah, good point, Gail. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hmm? Okay. Okay. So why this is important, right? Um, how they are over time and in multiple environments. Because what we know is, wow, oh, that's big. What the, the child can't do alone, right? The child can do with assistance. It's moving towards the green, okay? This is the zone of proximal development. Where our interventions are, are gonna be right there, all right? We're gonna get them where they can use that assistance. So going back to what Michael brought up, they're not always gonna get to can do alone but at least they're gonna have the tools to then keep up with their peers, okay? And if you remember the failure cycle, keeping up with your peers is gonna be really important, or at least closer to your peers, okay? This is a nice way to explain it to parents as well because we can show them, well, we're moving in this direction, okay? We're looking at what your child needs and we're gonna help them get as close as they can to doing it alone. So treatment, let's talk about treatment. So interventions must be at the point of performance. Anybody wanna guess what the point of performance is? What's that? When it needs to be done. Yeah, exactly, it's right there, right? Right there when they need to call upon those skills is, is right where we need to give them to them. So if I see a kid in my office once a week for 50 minutes, Right? We're going to have fun, but if I don't send him home with anything, then it's, he's not going to remember it. Right? He's, he's not going to be able to call upon uh, the skills that he learned in my office once he gets to that point of performance. Right? Because we know that these kids, they don't hold things in mind very well. Right? So treatment for disorders that involve executive functioning and delays and deficits we need to make all of the interventions at the point of performance, right? We need to externalize all of their executive functions, right? So that they can grab them right there when they need them. We won't see very much improvement if we don't do that. I can guarantee you that. 
So because it's at a point of performance, we need a coach. That's usually a parent, right? It could be um, the teachers. Talk to a lot of teachers about this. Um, talk to a lot of after school programs about this, right? Because we'll need to engage them as the coach as well. So therapy becomes, um, the parents are, are really hugely involved in therapy. Okay, so we need to make mental information external, right? That's cues, that's signs, that's charts, as Gail mentioned. We need to make time external, clocks, timers. We need to break that book report down into baby steps. Right? Because they are not going to remember a book report over here. Okay, great, right? We need to break it down for them. Okay, and the clocks have to have alarms, right? Because they may not remember to look up at the clock when they need to. So alarms, right? This is Siri, you guys. This is Siri, right? Siri reminds me all the time to do things, okay? <laughs> all right. So motivation, we need to make motivation external, and that is consequences and rewards really often. So if we think back, this is the executive versus the automatic, right? Well, what we know about automatic is its stimulus response, right? Skinnerian. So we need to make consequences and rewards right there, right? They need to be motivated. So I used, to, I used to kind of joke when I worked in the schools that I could build my case by going into some of the classrooms, looking at the teacher reward charts, and finding the two kids that don't have many rewards, right? That's my caseload right there. Because these kids can't hold that motivation, right? That delayed gratification. So getting a toy out of the toy chest sounds fun, right? but they're not gonna be able to hold in mind all the things that they need to do to get there, right? To get all of those points. So lots of rewards. We need to take that delayed gratification and we need to move it way up here, right? So it's just gratification. And that's gonna motivate them. Small rewards often is gonna motivate them. Okay, problem solving physical. This is a good one if you're working with kids in the classroom, right? Um, this is kind of the math pieces, right? You kind of spread them out, you can make it physical, okay? So building success, really important for these kids, right? Because they're, they're frustrated, they're tired, right? They've tried a lot of things. They, their parents have probably tried a lot of things, right? A lot of consequences that didn't work. So, boy, getting them to try something else that can be hard to do. So building success is really important. So we don't take the, the thing that they're having the most trouble with, right? We know this as clinicians and say, okay, here, you're gonna try this, right? You're gonna break it down. So you're gonna try it in your office, right? You're gonna use the treatments in your office first and then make it in a really easy place in their, in, at home, right? And then you're gonna talk to the teachers and get them involved, right? So you're, so you're building success by kind of scaffolding what they can do. Feel the brain tank. Okay, this is important for these kids. So we know that it's kind of exhausting going to school all day, right? Even for neurotypical kids, it it's can be exhausting. And what happens when we get exhausted is we're draining the brain tank, is, is what I call it. And it works with kids. And so to fuel that, we need to give them breaks. Right, that's uh, 10 minutes of homework with a three minute break, okay? We need to keep them kind of motivated, right? That's the rewards. And, and we also need to give them ways that they can give themselves positive self-talk, right? Because they're, they're missing that internalized speech or it's delayed, right? It's not as, not as strong. Okay. So you get a kid in, um, let's say a kid goes to school all day and then he does his homework and then he has his therapy appointment, right? Where's his brain tank, his brain tank, right? Really low. That's why play comes in really important too because we can, we can get them in, involved, right? We can get them engaged. They're a little bit more receptive. They've had a chance to relax and be playful. All right, the good news, lots of good news. I'm gonna move my list here. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we, we can't necessarily train away ADHD, right? I'm certainly making no claims to that. 
but keeping in mind the failure cycle, we can help these children meet their challenges, right? We can give them the tools that they need and not assume that, that their world is one of neurotypical kids where they have the tools that they already need. So the Stanford researchers that did that marshmallow experiment, right, they went back with those kids and they said, hey, what do you think? If we showed you a way to get those two marshmallows, would you want to? Yeah, sure, right? So they showed them some things, right? Sing a song, distract yourself, right? And what happened, they tested them again and these kids, they, they performed as well as the naturally strong inhibitors did, okay? That gives us some valuable information. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some treatments, right? Some play interventions. Any questions before we move to that? Maybe we'll yeah. move to this in Please. a minute. But, yeah. uh, you talked about giving them something when they leave. Yes. So for instance, yes. and are you gonna go over that or is it yes. a good time? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Perfect, segue. So it, it, the way you're speaking of it, it sounds like you think of uh, deficits in executive functioning are organic or a disease. And I'm really interested in the developmental aspect. For example, you say I'm listening. you can't train them to have executive functions, but it sounds like, I mean, from my perspective, mm -hmm. as developmentally attachment oriented person, yep. they're trained to have executive functioning deficits. And so I'm interested in what happens in the first two years of life, first three, first four, that ends up mm -hmm. with this kid being diagnosed mm -hmm. ADHD mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in uh, preschool. We can see that there's, there's an abnormality in the frontal lobe, which is where these executive functions develop, right? So trained, trained to have deficits. Tell me what you mean. Well, by that. is the abnormality mm -hmm. something that's organic, genetically mm -hmm. determined, uh, or is it a result mm. of deficits in the maternal relationship with baby? I see. Well, it's important to model, right? We're modeling to kids all the time, and that, and that helps their, their social skills, right? Their emotional control, it's because we're modeling, but it, it's also biological, absolutely. Right, so, this, so there's neurobiological markers for ODD, right, for conduct disorder. So we can see that there, it is biological as well as nurturing. Just Certainly, at birth, you could take a, do a DNA scan at birth and say, okay, this kid's going to be ODD. I don't know when they tested those kids, at, but I mean, if there's, if it's a biological marker, you would think. But it also brings in the importance of modeling and stuff because we can shape, right? We know it's not necessarily one or the other exclusively, right? Oh, <laughs> thank you, Bruce. You know, Jennifer, I have something yeah. to say about that. Yeah, please. Maybe you can add to it. Um, it's a controversial name to bring up, but Daniel Amen and his brain scans mm -hmm. has shown a lot of mm -hmm. common themes in those brain scans with certain mm -hmm. kinds of executive mm -hmm. function mm -hmm. deficits. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, there are other researchers that mm -hmm. aren't as commercialized and controversial as Daniel Amen mm -hmm. who are turning up the same kind of material with brain scans, showing that in these kinds of deficits, there are commonalities in, mm -hmm. in, in the brain. Mm -hmm. the people who I, have. I'm just mm -hmm. I'm trying to be a hard scientist here, which is where I was trained. The fact that there, if you scan the brain of a five-year-old or a seven-year-old and you find uh, abnormalities that he has in common with others who have the same diagnosis, it doesn't mean he was born that way, right? Yeah. You see? No, Dr. Amen, Dr. Amen can tell the difference between a disorder that happened like prenatal mm -hmm. and a disorder that's from him. He can yeah. discern the difference between <coughs> with his mm -hmm. I've seen mm -hmm. some yeah, thank you. No, you bring up an important important point about traumatic brain injury, um, and, and with conduct disorder, what they've seen is they they've taken a children with con with um, traumatic brain injury, specifically to the frontal lobe, right, and they've compared it to adults with traumatic brain injury, and what they see is that the, the children have they act out more violently, aggressively without that disregard for others, right, where the the, the adults could rely on a preformed mental construct. So traumatic brain injury is a good point of, you know, if that part 
you know, is injured, right, it definitely plays a part. Yeah? Well, I think aside from traumatic injury, there are also the emotional injuries kids get. Yeah, trauma. Yeah, right, right. PTSD, right? We don't, we don't get that chance to kind of develop those, right? Executive functions, because we're kind of, we're in reaction. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's a good conversation. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, 